Hello, and welcome to a special episode of Bloodborne. You see, my microphone audio did not record initially, and so I'm re-recording this. And so today I'll be reading for you a tale from The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. The Wife of Bath's Tale The Prologue <clears throat> Experience, though no other authority were in this world, is quite enough for me to speak of woe that is in marriage. For, lordings, since I twelve years of, was of age, thanks be to God who is eternally alive. Husbands at church door have I had five, if I so often might have wedded be. All and all were worthy in their behalf. But I was told, truly, not long ago, that since Christ never went but once to wedding in the Cana of Galilee, that by the same example taught he me that I should not be wedded but once. Hearken also to the sharp word beside a well that Jesus, God and man, spoke in reproof to the Samaritan. You have had five husbands said he, and that same man who now has you is not your husband. Thus said he certain. What he meant thereby I cannot say, except I ask why the fifth man was not husband to the Samaritan. How many might she have in marriage? Yet never have I heard tell in all my time of this number and explanation. Men may interpret and gloss up and down, but well I know especially, without lie, God bade us for to increase and multiply. That noble text can I well understand. Also well I know, he said, my husband should leave father and mother and take to me. But of no number mentioned made he, of in succession how many. Why should men then speak of it reproachfully? Lo, hear the wise king. Lord Solomon. I believe he had wives more than one. Would to God it were allowed for me to be refreshed half so often as he. What a gift of God had he for all his wives. No man has such who in the world alive now is. God knows this noble king, so far as I can see. The first night had many a merry fight, with each of them so lucky was his life. Blessed be God that I have wedded five. Welcome the sixth when he arrives. For in truth, I will not keep myself all chance. When my husband is from this world gone, some Christian man shall wed me anon. For then the apostle says that I am free to wed on God's behalf where it pleases me. He says that to be wedded is no sin better to be wedded than to burn. What matters it to me, though folk speak badly, of Curse Klamek and his bigamy? I know well that Abraham was a holy man, and Jacob also, as far as I know, and each of them had wives more than two, and many another holy man also. Where can you see, in whatever age, that high God forbid marriage by express word? I pray you, tell me, or where commanded in virginity. I know as well as you, it is no doubt, that the apostle, when he spoke of maidenhood, he said commandment thereof had he none. Men may counsel a woman to be one, but counseling is no commandment. He put it in our own judgment. Or had God commanded maidenhood, then he would have damned wedding in that deed. And certainly, if there were no seed sown, virginity, then whereof should it grow? Paul dared not in the, last, in the least command, a thing of which his master gave no behest. The prize is set up for virginity. Catch it whoso may, who runs best, let's see. But this word is not taken by every person. 
but to whom God chooses in his might. I well know that the apostle was a maid, but nevertheless, though he wrote and said, he would that every person were such as he. All this just recommends virginity. And for to be a wife, he gave me leave by indulgence. So it is no reproach to wed me, if that my mate die, without accusation of bigamy. Although were it good no woman to touch, he meant as in his bed or in his couch. For peril is both spark and tinder to assemble. You know what this example may resemble. This all and some. He held virginity more perfect than wedding in frailty. Frailty, I call it, unless he and she would lead all their lives in chastity. I grant it well, I have no envy, though maidenhood be preferred to bigamy. They wish to be clean, body and soul. Of my condition I will make no boast. For well you know, a lord in his household has not every vessel all of gold. Some be of wood, and do their lord's service. God calls folk to him in sundry ways. Everyone has from God his special virtue. Some this, some that, as he chooses. Virginity is great perfection, and continence also, if coupled with devotion. But Christ, who of perfection is the source, bade not every person that he should go sell all that he had and give it to the poor, and in such way follow him and his footsteps. He spoke to those who would live perfectly, and lordlings, by your leave, that is not I. I will bestow the flower of my prime age in the axe and fruit of marriage. Tell me also to what purpose were organs for procreation shaped and by so perfect a workman wrought. Brushed right well, they were not made for none. Interpret who will and say both up and down that they were made for purgation of urine and both our things small were also to tell a female from a male. And for no other cause, say you know, the experience know well it is not so, so that theologians be not with me wroth. I say this, that they were made for both, that is to say, for purpose and pleasure of procreation. Therefore, we do not, di we do not God displease. Why should men otherwise in their books set that man shall give to his wife her debt? Now, where should he make his payment if he uses not his blessed instrument? Therefore, were they made upon a creature to purge urine and also to engender. But I say not that everyone is bound, who has such equipment that I to you told, to go and use them in procreation. Then should men take of chastity no concern. Christ was a maid and formed as a man, and many a saint, since the world began, lived ever in perfect chastity. I will not envy virginity. Let virgins be bred of the finest wheat, and let us wives be barley breed. And yet with barley bread, as St. Mark tell can, our Lord Jesus refreshed many a man. In such condition as God has called us, I will persevere. I am not fastidious. In wifehood I will use my instrument as generously as my maker has it sent. If I be reluctant, God give me sorrow. My husband shall have it both eve and morrow, when that he wishes to come forth his debt to pay. A husband will I have, I will not fail, who shall be both my debtor and my thrall, and have his tribulation besides upon his flesh, all that I need and his man. I have the power during all my life over his own body and not he. Right thus the apostle told it unto me, and bade our husbands for to love us well. And that makes me happy, as you may tell. Up started the pardoner, and that enough. Now, dame, said he, by God and by St. John, you be a noble preacher in this case. I was about to wed a wife. Alas, 
Why should I pay for it with my flesh so dear? Now would I prefer to wed no wife this year. Abide, said she, my tale is not begun. Nay, you shall drink of another barrel before I go, which shall taste worse than ale. And then, and when that I have told you forth my tale of tribulation and marriage, of which I've been expert all my years, this is to say, I myself have been the whip. Then you choose whether or not to sit. Of that same cask I will wish. Be wary of it, before you too near approach, for I shall tell examples more than ten. He won't he who won't be warned by other men, by him shall other men corrected be. The same words wrote Tom. Read in his amalgus, and take it there. Dame, I would pray you, if you will it be, said this pardon. As you began, tell forth your tale, hold back for no man, and teach us young men of your practice. Gladly, said she, since it may you please. But yet I pray to all this company, if I speak according to my fantasy, take it not badly what I say, for my intent is not but to play. Ahem. Now, sires, now will I tell forth my tale, as ever might I drink wine or ale. I shall say the truth of those husbands that I had, as three of them were good and two men. The three men were good and rich and poor, just barely could they the statute uphold by which they were bound to. You know well what I mean by this, by God. So help me, I laugh when I think how pitiably at night I made them work. And by my faith, I set by it no store. They had given me their land and their treasure. I, need not, I needed not to work at it any longer to win their love or do them honor. They loved me so well, by God above, that they took for granted all their love. A prudent woman will busy herself every moment to get herself beloved, where she has none. But since I had them wholly in my hand, and since they had given me all their land, why should I take care for them to please, unless it were for my profit and my ease? I set them so to working, by my faith, that many a night they sang, Well away! That reward in Essex, I promise, went not to them for merry bliss. I governed them so well after my law that each of them full happy was and eager to bring me gay dames from the fair. They were full glad when I spoke to them nicely, for God knows I tidied them. Now listen how I handled myself, you prudent wives who can understand. Thus shall you speak and put them in the wrong. For half so boldly can any man swear and lie as a woman can. I say this not about wives who be careful, unless they do something not so rare. A wise wife, if she knows her own good, shall assure him the talking bird is crazy, and take as witness her own maid with her consent. But listen how I said. Sir old dotard, is this your idea of raiment? Why is my neighbor's wife dressed so gaily? She is honored wherever she goes. I sit at home. I have no good clothes. What do you at my neighbor's house? Is she so fair? Are you so amorous? What whisper you with our maid? Benedicite. Sir old lecher, let your pranks be. And if I have a male confidant or a friend, not a paramour, you scold like a fiend. If that I walk or play unto his house. You come home drunk as a mouse, and preach from your bench bad luck to you. You say to me, it is a great mischief to wed a poor woman due to expense. And if that she be rich of high parentage, then you say that it is a torment to suffer her pride and temper. And if that she be fair, you, true knave, you say that every letter will her have. She may no while in chastity abide, who is assailed on every side. You say some folk desire for our money, some for our shape, and some for our beauty, and some because she can either sing or dance, and some for good breeding and coquetry, some for her hands and her arms slender. Thus go all to the devil by your account. You say men may not defend a castle wall if it may be everywhere assailed, and if that she meet 
And if that she be ugly, you say that she covets every man that she may see. For as a spaniel she would on him leap, till that she find some man with her to sleep. There swims no goose so great in the lake, as, you say, that would be without me. And you say, it is a hard thing to control, a thing that no man willingly will hold. Thus say you, wretch, when you go to bed, and that no wise man needs for to wed, nor any man who intends heaven to enter. With wild thunderclap and fiery lightning, may your withered neck be broken. You say that leaking houses and smoke and chiding wives make men flee out of their own house. Ah, Benedict, what ails such an old man for to chide? You say we wives will our vices hide till we be married, and then we will then redeem. Well, may that be a proverb fit for a villain. You say that oxen, asses, horses, and hounds, they be tested at various times. <clears throat> Basins, washbowls, before men them buy, spoons and stools and all such household goods, and so be pots, clothes, and the rest. But folk of wives make no test till they be wedded, old nasty wretch. And then, you say, we will our vices show. You say also that it displeases me, unless you will praise my beauty, and look with longing upon my face, and call me fair dame in every place. And unless you make a feast on that same day that I was born and make me fresh and gay, and unless you do to my nurse honor and to my chambermaid within my bedchamber and to my father's folk and his cousins, thus say you, old barrel full of wives. And yet of our apprentice Jenkin, for his curly hair, shining as gold so fine, and because he squires me both up and down, Yet you have caught a false suspicion. I want him not, though you were dead tomorrow. But tell me this, why do you hide, and you will be sorry, the keys of your treasure chest away from you? It is my property as well as yours, my God. Why, what do you mean making an idiot of our name? Now by that Lord who is called Saint James, you shall not both Though you were mad with rage, be master of all my goods and my body. One of them shall you forfeit, no matter what you try. What does it help you on me to inquire or spy? I believe you would lock me in your chest. You should say, wife, go where you please. Have your fun. I will not any tales believe. I know you for a true wife, Dame Alice. We love no man who keeps track or cares where that we go when we tend to our affair. Of all men blessed may he be, the wise astrologer, Lord Ptolemy, who said this proverb in his Almagest. Almagest? Of all men his wisdom is the highest, who never cares who has this world in his hand. By this proverb you shall understand, if you have enough, why should you counter care how merrily that other folks fare? For certain, old daughter, by your leave, you shall have quite enough at eve. He is too great a... I'm not going to say that word. Who would refuse a man to light a candle at his lantern? Wow. He shall not miss the light by God. If you have enough, you should not complain. You say also that if we make us gay with clothing and jewelry, that is risky for a chastity. And further, may you regret it, you insist and say these words in the apostle's name. In clothing made with chastity and shame, you women should yourselves attire, said he, and not in braided hair and jewelry, nor pearls, nor, pearls, nor gold, nor garments fancy, neither by your text nor your reading of it, will I live as much as would a man. You said this, that I was like a cat. For whoso would singe a cat's fur, then would the cat dwell well in his home. And if the cat's fur be sleek and gay, she will not dwell at home half a day. But go forth she will, before day has dawned, to show her fur 
and go catch a walk. This is to say, if I be pretty, Sir Welladay, I will go out to my wardrobe for to display. Sir Old Fool, how does it help you to spy, though you beg Argus with his hundred eyes? Be my minder, as best he knows, in faith he shall follow only as I allow. I could give him the slip, so may I thrive. You say also that there be things three which trouble all this earth, and that no person may endure. And the fourth, O oh dear sir, well a day, may Jesus shorten your life. You are still preaching that a hateful wife is the cause of one of these mischances. Be there no other resemblances that you may liken to your parabels, unless an innocent wife be one of those? You will liken also woman's love to hell, to barren land where water may not dwell. You liken it also to wildfire. The more it burns, the more it has desire to consume everything that burns it can be. You say that just as worms damage a tree, right so a wife destroys her husband. This know they who to wives be bound. <coughs> Lordings write thus, as you have understood, I led my old husbands so firmly by their nose that thus they said in their drunkenness, and all was false, and yet I took witness, from Jankin and my niece also. O Lord, the suffering I caused them and the woe, full guiltless, by God's sweet suffering, for like a horse I bite and whinny, I would complain, though I was guilty. Otherwise oftentimes would I have been ruined. Whoso to the mill first comes, first grinds. I complained first, so was our strife concluded. They were full glad to excuse full quickly themselves of things which they were never guilty. Of wenches would I accuse them on every hand, when that for illness they could scarcely stand. Yet warmed I his heart, for all he thought I had him for his great charity. I swore that all my walking out by night was to espy wenches that he might lay by. Under that pretense had I many a mirth, for all such cleverness is given us in our birth. Deceit, weeping, Spinning God has given to women by nature while they live. And thus of one thing I boast. In the end, I got the better of them in every way, by trickery or force or some other thing, as by continual murmur or rage. Especially in bed had they misfortune. There would I scold and give them no pleasure. I would no longer in the bed abide, if that I felt his arm over my side. till he had paid his ransom unto me. Then would I suffer him to do his little part. And therefore to every man this tale I tell, profit whoso may, for all is for sale. With empty hand men may no hawks lure, for gain would I all his lust endure, and make me a feigned appetite, and yet in old meat never had I delight. That is why that ever I would them chide, for though the Pope had them sat beside, I would not spare them at their own table. For by my troth, I requited for them word for word. So help me true God omnipotent, though I right now should make my will and testament. I left no word unreturned. I brought it so about by my cleverness that they must give it up as for the best, or else had we never been in rest. For though he looked like a lion maddened, yet should he fail in the end. Then would I say, Sweetheart, take heed how meekly looks Wilkin our sheep. Come near, my spouse, let me kiss her cheek. You should be all patient and meek, and have a disposition seasoned sweetly, since you so speak of Job's patience. Endure always, since you so well can preach, and, le and unless you do, for certain, we shall you teach that it is nice to have a wife in peace. One of us two must give in, doubtless, and since a man is more reasonable than woman is, you must be patient. What ails you to crouch and groan? Is it that you would have my bell shows alone? Why take it all? Lo, have it every bit. By Saint Peter, I curse you, but you love it well. For if I would sell my bell shows, I could walk as fresh as is a rose. But I will keep it for your own appetite. You be to blame by God, I tell you the truth. Like that back and forth we bandied, now will I speak of my fourth husband. 
My fourth husband was a reveler. That is to say, he had a paramour. And I was young and full of appetite, stubborn and strong and dull like his own. Well could I dance to a harp small, and sing truly as any nightingale. When I had drunk a draught of sweet wine, Metellius, the foul churl, the swine, who with a staff bereft his wife of her life, for she drank wine, though if I had been his wife, he should have not have, he should not have frightened me from drink. And after wine on Venus must I think, for all so surely as cold engenders hail, a thirsty mouth must have a thirsty tail. In women full of wine there's no defense, this knows lechers by experience. But, Lord Christ, when I think upon my youth and on my gaiety, it tickles me about my heart's root. Unto this day it does my heart good, that in my time I have had my world. But age, alas, that all will poison, has me bereft my beauty and my faith. Let it go, farewell, the devil with it go. The flower is gone, there is no more to tell. The husk, as best I can, now must I sell. But yet to be right merry will I try. Now will I tell of my fourth husband. I say, I had in heart great spite, that he of any other had delight. But he was repaid by God and St. Joseph. I made him of some of the same wood a cross, not of my body in an unclean manner, but certainly to other men I was so nice. That in his own grace I made him cry for anger and for guilt, pure jealous I. By God, on earth I was his purgatory, for which I hope his soul be in chloride. For God it knows he sat full often and sang, when that his shoe full bitterly fitted him up. There was no person save God and he, who knew how many ways I sorely him tormented. He died when I returned from Jerusalem, and lies buried inside a chapel, although his tomb was not so ornamented as was the sepulchre of old Bar which that of hell skillfully wrought, it would have been a waste to bury him at high cost. May he farewell. God rest his soul. He is now in the grave. <coughs> now of my fifth husband will I tell. God let his soul never come in hell. And yet he was to me the worst rascal. Soreness on my ribs I still feel from a scuffle, and ever shall unto my dying day. But in our bed he was so fresh and gay, and therewithal so well could he me persuade when he would have my bell shows, that though he would have beaten me on every bone, he could win again my love anon. I believe I loved him best, for that he was of his love grudging to me. We women have, if that I shall not lie, in this manner and on fantasy. Whatever thing we may not lightly have, thereafter we will cry all day and pray. Forbid us something in that desire we, pursue us hard and then we will flee. For the haughty we set out of all our wear, great cow that market makes things dear. And for too good a bargain we little care. This knows every woman who is wise. My fifth husband, God his soul blessed. Who that I took for love and no riches. He was once a scholar at Oxford and had left school and went home to board with my close friend dwelling in our town. God save her soul, her name was Alison. She knew my heart and also my secrets better than our parish priest, so may I flourish. To her I revealed my I to her I re the grand Ahem To her revealed I my feelings all for had my husband pissed on a wall, or done a thing that should have cost his life, to her and to another worthy wife, and to my niece, whom I loved well, I would tell his secrets in detail. And so I did often, God well knows, that made his face full often red and hot for pure shame, and blamed himself because he had told me so great a secrecy. And so it befell that once during Lent, so oftentimes that to my friend I went, for ever yet I loved to be gay, and for to walk in March, April, and May. From house to house to hear sundry tale, that Jenkin the scholar and my friend Alice, and I myself into the field. My husband was at London all that Lent. I had the better chance to play, and for to see, and also to be seen by my support. What knew I where grace was meant for me, or in what place? Therefore I made visitations, 
these day services and processions, to preachings and to these pilgrimages, to plays of miracles and marriages, and warm my gaze while it Those worms, nor mine, nor mites, on my soul's part, ate them not. And you know why? But they were used. Now will I tell forth what happened to me. I say that in the field walked we, till truly we were getting on so well, the scholar and all, that in my foresight I spoke to him, and how that he, if I were bidded, widowed, should wed me. For certainly I say for no boast, yet I was never without future provision in him, not to mention other I hold a mouse's heart not worth a leaf, that would but come forth for to life, and that fails on his name. I had him believe he had enchanted me, his mother taught me that subtlety, and also I said I dreamed of him all night, that he would mean slay as on my back I lay, and all my bed was full of blood. But yet I hoped that he should do me good, for blood betokens gold as I must have, and all was false. I dreamed of it right not, and as I followed always my dame's lore, as well with this as other things. But now, sire, let me see, what was I saying? Aha! By God, I have met him again. When that my fourth husband was on his beard, I wept, of course, and wore a sorry expression as my lust. For it is the custom. And with my kerchief covered my face, but because I was provided with a mate, I wept but little that I could. To church was my husband born in the morning with his neighbors, who for him made sorrow, and Jenkin our scholar was one of them. So help me God. When I saw him walk after the beer, methought he had a pair of legs on the feet from the pain, that all my heart he gave to his hope. He was, I believe, twenty inches And I was forty, if I shall say right, but yet I had always a false appetite. Gap tooth I was, and that became me well. I had the birthmark of St. Venus seal. So help me God, I was a lusty one, and fair, and rich, and young, and truly, as my husband told me, I had the best fidendum that might be. For certain, for certainly, I am all venerian, in feeling, and my heart is martial. Venus gave me my lust, my lecherousness, and Mars gave me my sturdy boldness. My ascendant was Taurus, and Mars there. Alas, alas, that ever love was sin. I followed always my inclination, by virtue of my consolation, so I could not withhold my chamber of Venus from a good thought. Yet I have Mars mark upon my face, and also in another private place. For God so wise be my salvation, I never loved with any wisdom, but ever followed my enemy. Whether he were short or long, or black or white, I didn't care as so long as he pleased me of who he was, nor of what level in society. Would it, what, should I, what should I say but, at the month's end, this jolly scholar Jankin, who was so nice, had wedded me with great solemnity, and to him gave I all the land and property that ever was given me there before. But afterward, I regretted it for sure. He wouldn't give me anything I pleased. By God, he hit me once on the ear, because I tore from his book a leaf, and from that stroke my ear went down. Stubborn I was as is a lioness, and with my tongue a true wasp. And walked I would, as I had before done, from house to house, although he had it forbidden, for which he oftentimes would preach, and me of old Roman stories teach, how Simplicius Gallus left his wife, and her forsook the rest of his life, only because he her bareheaded saw, looking out their door upon a day. Another Roman told he me by name, who, because his wife was at summer's revel, without his knowing he too for her sook. And then would he in his Bible seek the same proverb of Ecclesiasticus, where he commands and sternly forbids man should not allow his wife to roam about. Then would he say right thus, without doubt, Whoso builds his house of willow twigs, and spurs his blind horse over ploughed furrows, and his wife to go seek shrines allows, is worthier to be hanged on the gallows. But all for naught, 
I give not a hawthorn berry, or his proverbs, nor his old song, nor would I by him corrected be. I hate him whom my vices describes to be, and so do more of us, God knows, than I. This made him with me angry completely. I would not go along with him in any case. Now will I tell you the truth, by St. Thomas, why I tore out of his book a leaf, for which he smacked me so that I was thief. He had a book that gladly, night and day, for his disport he would read always. He called it Valerie and Theophrast, at which book he would laugh and laugh. And also there was once a scholar at Rome, a cardinal, who was called St. Jerome, who made a book against Jovinian, in which there was Tertullian. Chrysippus, Shrotila, and Heloise, who was the abbess not far from Paris, and also the Proverbs of Solomon, Ovid's Art of Love, and books many a one. And all these were bound in one volume, and every night and day was his costume, when he had leisure and free time from other worldly occupation, to read in his book of wicked wives. He knew of them more legends and lives than there are of good wives in the Bible. For trust well, it is an impossibility that any scholar will speak good of wives, but unless it be of holy saints' lives, nothing of any other woman ever. Who painted the lion? Tell me, who? By God, if women had written stories, as scholars have within their oratories, they would have written of men more wickedness than all the sects of Adam may redress. The children of Mercury and of Venus be in their behavior full contrarious. Mercury loves science and wisdom, and Venus loves revelry and to spend. And because of their diverse dispositions, each falls in the moment of their highest ascent. And thus, God knows, Mercury is powerless. In Pisces, where Venus is at her greatest, and Venus falls there where Mercury has risen. Therefore, no woman by a scholar is prized. The scholar, when he is old and may not do of Venus's works with his old shoe, then he sits he down and writes in his dotage that women cannot be faithful in marriage. But now to the purpose why I told you that I was beaten for a book by God. Upon a night, Jenkin, who was my lord, read in his book as he sat by the fire. Of Eve first, who for her wickedness was all mankind brought to wretchedness. For which that Jesus Christ himself was slain, who bought us with his heart blood again. Lo, here specifically of woman may you find, who causes the loss to all mankind. Then read he me how Samson lost his hair. Sleeping, she cut it with her shears, through which treason lost he both his eyes. Then read he me, if that I shall not lie, of Hercules and his Deanira, who caused him to set himself afire. Nothing forgot he the sorrow and the woe that Socrates had with his wife's toe. How Xantippe cast piss upon his head, this poor man sat still as if he were dead. He wiped his head, no more dared he say, but before thunder ceases there comes a rain. Of Pasiphae, who was the queen of Crete, out of meanness, him thought this tale sweet. Fie, speak no more, it is a grisly thing of her horrible lust and her liking. Of Clitamen, Clitamen, Clitanestra, for her lettery, who falsely made her husband for to die. He read it with full good of devotion. He told me also what, uh, for what occasion Amphiaros at Thebes lost his life. My husband had a legend of his wife, Eriphalem, who for a brooch of gold had secretly unto the Greeks told, where her husband hid in place, for which he had at Thebes misfortune. Of Livia, he told me, and of Lucilia. They both made their husbands for to die, that one for love, the other was for hate. Livia, her husband, on an evening late, poisoned him, for she was his foe. Lucilia, lecherous, loved her husband so that so she would always upon her think she gave him such a kind of love drink that he was dead before it was the morrow. And thus always husbands have sorrow. Then he told me how one Latumus complained unto his companion Arius, who in his garden grew a certain tree 
on which he said how his wife's three hanged themselves for spite. Oh, dear brother, said this Arius, give me a cutting of that blessed tree, and in my garden planted shall it be. Of later date of wives had he read, who some had slain their husbands in their beds, and let their lovers lie with them all night, while the corpse lay on the floor with open eyes. And some had driven nails in their brains, while they slept, and thus had they had them slain. Some had in their drink given them poison. He spoke more harm than heart may imagine, and in addition he knew of more proverbs than in this world were grow, there grow grass or herbs. Better it is, said he, your habitation be with a lion or a foul dragon than with a woman accustomed for to chide. Better it is, said he, high on the roof abide than with an angry wife down in the house. They be so wicked and contrarious, they hate what their husbands love ever. He said, A woman casts her shame away when she casts off her underclothes. And furthermore, a fair woman, unless she be chaste also, is like a gold ring in a sow's nose. Who would guess, or who would suppose, the woe that in my heart was and pain? And then I saw that he would never finish to read in this cursed book all night, while suddenly three pages have I ripped out of his book right as he read, and also I with my fist so hit him on the cheek that in our fire he fell backward down, and he got up as does an angry lion. And with his fist he struck me on the head, that on the floor I lay as if I were dead. And when he saw how still that I lay, he was aghast, and would have fled away, till at last out of my swoon I breathed. Oh, have you slain me, you thief? I said. And for my land, have you murdered me? Before I be dead, yet I will kiss you. And near he came and kneeled fair down, and said, Dear sister Allison, so help me God, I shall never you strike, but for what I've done you have yourself to blame. Forgive it me, and that I you beseech. And yet again I hit him on the cheek, and said, Thief, thus much I am avenged. Now will I die, I am no longer speak. But at last, with much care and woe, we came to an agreement between us two. He gave me the bridle completely in my hand, to have the governance of house and land. And of his tongue, it, uh, his land, uh, his hand also, and made him burn his book anon right then. And when that I make, and when that I had gotten for myself by mastery and all the sovereignty, and that he said, my own true wife, do as you please for the rest of your life, preserve your honor and keep my reputation. After that day, we had never debate. God help me so, I was to him as kind as any wife from Denmark unto India, and just as true. And so was he to me. I prayed to God who sits in majesty. So bless his soul by his mercy dear. Now will I say my tale, if you will hear. And that was the prologue to the wife of Bath's tale. That was quite the adventure. If I do say so myself. I hope you enjoyed it. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and all that good stuff. Thank you very much for watching, if you do happen upon such a video, and I hope you have a great day.